Hello, welcome everyone to our first episode of Conversations About COVID. So excited to start this much needed conversation with you all today. Hi, Aram. Anybody who's joining, please give us a wave, um, say hello, let us know where you're from. Um, we are going to be answering questions live, so I'm going to be um, adding our guest on very shortly. Hi, H. Zaidi. Hello. Hi, everyone. And um, if you want to put any of your questions in the question box or your comments, uh, we would love to hear from you. And I'm really excited to get this conversation started. All right. Hi, Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Good, Alhamdulillah. How are you? Good. Alhamdulillah. Good. Good. Good so, glad, so glad you could join me today. And I'm so happy that we get to collaborate again on a really important topic. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, same here. So, um, you know, everyone's joining us today. I want to say hi. Hi, Sarah. Say hi to everyone uh, that is joining us. They're going to be putting in their comments. Um, you know, we'd like to give little shout outs to them. Uh, but I've also asked them to send us questions in our question box down there. Um, and that we'll be more than happy to answer any of this, their questions as we go along. And obviously, we're going to, um, you know, cover a bunch of questions that we've gotten beforehand. Um, so I'll just introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Dr. Osma Sayed. I'm an infectious disease physician, adult infectious disease physician um, based out of New York. And today I've got a wonderful guest with me today. Joining me is Dr. Noura Kras, who is a pediatric infectious disease specialist um, who specializes in hospital medicine as well, which is really important because, um, you know, many of the cases um, that are affecting children uh, we are seeing in the hospital setting. So it's really important to have her um, expertise and, you know, her experiences uh, that she's going to share with us. Hi, Zainab. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Um, so I just want to give a brief update. You know, um, as you are aware, we are unfortunately have reached many milestones, um, not really good ones with COVID-19. We've uh, breached our over 10 million mark uh, of cases worldwide. We're over 2.6 million cases in the U.S. Um, you know, we have significant mortality with over half a million um, cases worldwide. You know, over 500,000 uh, people have died. And the numbers keep escalating, um, as you're aware. And many parts of the U.S. unfortunately have really rising numbers um, of COVID-19. And it's really alarming, um, the trajectory that we have right now. In New York, we've been able to really get our numbers um, under control because we had really, um, you know, significant sheltering in place and sort of had hit the pause button for several months. Um, and now we've had a decline in cases. We are reopening many things, so we have to sort of wait and see where things go. Um, but unfortunately, many parts of the U.S. in the South and Southwest is where we're seeing significant um, increase in cases. So today we're going to take um, many questions, um, you know, from our audience, from our viewers. Um, and as I mentioned before, just give us, uh, you know, some comments and, the, and questions in the question box and we'll get to your questions. Right now we're looking at roughly, you know, for the U.S., we have about 40,000 cases per day. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, unfortunately a rather large number, um, you know, and it's, you know, lots of people are being affected by this and, you know, Fortunately, the pediatric population has not been affected um, to the same extent that the adult population has, and that's, you know, a good thing. Um, but, you know, uh, people are aware of the, you know, some of the, um, you know, rare findings that we do see in the pediatric population, and that's what I wanted to discuss with you today, um, Dr. Akras. So, First question that we have, um, that's a very common question I'm sure that you're getting very, very frequently as well, is, you know, about schools. So how safe is it to send kids back to school? So um, uh, thanks for inviting me to this um, Instagram Live. Um, uh, not only am I a pediatric infectious disease physician, but I'm also a mom of four kids aged 11, 9, 6, and 2. So, I mean, that question's been on my mind for a long time as well and wondering about you know, if schools do open up, will I be sending my children? Um, so um, the AAP just came out with a statement strongly recommending for schools to reopen. Uh, that's the American Academy of Pediatrics. And uh, the reason that that statement came out was um, weighing the benefits and risks of 
having kids stay at home uh, all this time and being quarantined versus uh, the risk of their transmission of, of SARS-CoV-2, their acquisition of the virus, uh, their hospitalizations, and their bringing it home to their parents or loved ones. And so um, the studies that have come out from Singapore, for example, who have kept schools in place for a couple of months, um, have shown that there isn't really significant pediatric transmission of SARS-CoV-2, which is really good news and is really helpful and um, really reassuring, uh, which is not to say that they're not transmitting it at all, but the numbers that they showed in this study showed that they actually had, haven't transmitted uh, the, the virus. Um, and so anything we do is a mitigating procedure. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is here to stay. It's not going anywhere for the foreseeable future. So we have to know that um, we're mitigating risk. We're not eliminating risk. So the things that we do mitigate the risk, but don't eliminate completely the risk. Um, and there was a study also in the Lancet that came out um, from one of the first European um, citizens to get um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and then subsequently get COVID. Um, and then they did some contact tracing with this gentleman who had gone to Singapore for a conference and probably acquired the infection there. Then he came back and then he went to the French Alps and stayed in a chalet and they contact traced all the adults and the children that were with him. And so there was one child that contracted the virus from him and that child went on to put two different schools and then also went on to like a ski school and nobody, nobody uh, contracted SARS-CoV-2 from him. So that's really important. Whereas the adults transmitted it to other people uh, in their adult life and in their adult circles. So um, it seems from the pediatric perspective that it's probably safe, quote unquote, I mean, re relatively, of course, you know, there are children who are at higher risk, um, children who are, have immune system problems. Uh, lung lung disease, uh, cardiac disease, kidney problems. Uh, those children are at higher risk um, of of getting sick if they get the virus. Um, but overall, the pediatric data shows that um, the risk is relatively lower uh, to contract SARS-CoV-2 to transmit it to get sick with it than the risk of them staying at home and all of the psychological issues that have been coming um, associated with quarantine. Um, and I can, you know, speak for my own children. Uh, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I can speak from my own experience as a mom. Um, there has been a lot of um, negative ramifications of children being quarantined at home. So if we do a risk benefit analysis, it seems that going back to school is more beneficial to children than the risk of um, either getting or transmitting SARS-CoV-2. Absolutely. I mean, those were excellent points. And I want to just elaborate on that a little bit. First, I just want everyone to just give us a quick thumbs up if you can hear us. One of the viewers said that the um, their visual was um, cutting in and out. So just if everyone can just give us a quick thumbs up to make sure that, um, you know, you can see us and hear us, we would really appreciate that. Um, so amazing points that Dr. Akras just uh, mentioned. And, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, the studies, you know, as she says, really do support that what we know so far, it does seem like um, most of the transmission is not happening between children, unlike other respiratory viruses where we see with influenza and other respiratory illnesses where it's really children that are driving all the transmission. And all of this data that we have right now is really showing that children that are contracting the virus, most of the time it's from, you know, the index case in the household. And that's really the adult in the household. And that's where the children are acquiring it from. So going forward for schools, I think, you know, the key is really going to be how much mitigation strategies they have in the school environment for to protect children, really, because, you know, you're looking at who's in that school environment, you have the teachers, you have the faculty, you have the support staff. So, you know, all of those factors are going to have to come into play. And, you know, we do know that schools are a vital part of, you know, communities, not just children, but communities. Um, and there's so much detrimental effects from, you know, children not being in school. Obviously, it's a very complex, you know, scenario, very complicated question. And there's so much risk benefit that people individually will have to have this conversation at their individual household. You know, who comprises their household? Do they have high risk, you know, senior citizens, grandparents living with them? Is the child itself themselves, you know, immunocompromised? You know, those kind of things. But we do know that this, you know, hold on schools is really widening that gap between the children that are already, you know, um, lagging behind and who are already having inequities. And, you know, these children are going to be far worse in far worse shape when things do get back to some sense of normal. So I really appreciate, you know, you really touching upon that. Um, you know, there's 
really no good scenario in this, but you know, I like the fact that you also highlighted that the American Academy of Pediatrics did put out some recommendations. The other thing that I think is interesting to note is that people need to also know that we are in this evolving pandemic, right? And things are constantly changing. I mean, we're still in our first wave. Our country is, you know, seeing spikes throughout. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the rare findings, the multi-system, you know, inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, but, you know, these are things that we have to, you know, obviously keep in the back of our mind that information shared today is obviously always subject to change as we learn so much about a novel virus. Um, so the next question that we had is, what is Kawasaki's disease and why do I hear about it with COVID? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, there was the multi-system uh, inflammatory syndrome uh, in children. So the acronym is MIS-C. Uh, in the UK, where it was first um, um, discovered or talked about, the acronym is PIMS, Pediatric Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome. So um, this syndrome has uh, been thought to be linked to SARS-CoV-2 because uh, um, there's been an increasing number of children who have a Kawasaki's-like disease or syndrome who are being admitted to hospitals um, in, in a frequent and unprecedented manner. So like an Italian study showed that there was a 30-fold increase in the post-SARS-CoV-2 uh, era. Um, and the UK, they had they, in one of the tertiary care centers there, they were admitting one to two patients like this every single day. Um, and so uh, this phenomenon um, is, is now thought to be linked to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, a lot of the children who get it um, have either antibody, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, or they've been known to be exposed to someone in their household four to six weeks prior, or they're SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive, uh, which is the least likely scenario. But in any case, this is a uh, inflammatory syndrome, as the name suggests, multi-system inflammatory syndrome affecting more than one organ system. And really the heralding signs are fever and GI symptoms, as opposed to in adults where we see um, the SARS-CoV-2 infection really causing respiratory symptoms. So in children, this multi-inflammatory sy multi-system inflammatory syndrome is presenting with fever um, and GI symptoms, so vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, and then the heralding sign that takes them into the ICU is hypotension, so their blood pressure drops. And no matter what people do, the blood pressure seems to not come back. So multiple um, fluid boluses and, and eventually starting on an epi drip, uh, epinephrine drip to keep their blood pressure up. And some kids go into heart failure from this syndrome. Again, it's very rare because, um, um, you know, uh, uh, as compared to the numbers of infections we have across the world, across the United States, the numbers of this syndrome are rare. So I don't want to scare anybody, but we do have to have our um, alert heightened a little bit about our children who have prolonged fever and GI symptoms who we know have been exposed to COVID. Um, and so these kids are ending up in the ICU, ending up uh, with a Kawasaki's-like disease, but it's not 100% like Kawasaki's. It also looks like toxic shock syndrome, uh, and it also looks like macrophage activation syndrome. So don't want to put too many uh, technical terminology out there, but this is the constellation of symptoms that we're looking at. So um, uh, blood pressure drops, uh, a rash, maybe some reddening of the eyes. So these are things that are associated with Kawasaki's also. Um, uh, maybe changes of the lips or the or the tongue, some reddening. Um, and so we've been treating it like a Kawasaki's uh, disease. So that treatment is IVIG, which is pooled antibody. Sometimes they need steroids and sometimes they need more immunologic uh, biologic uh, agents. Um, I've seen one case myself before we even, re it was reported. So that was back in early April before we even knew of the syndrome. Thank God our, our patient did well. Um, but the, it I was really that. frightening. The, I remember that yeah. case. That I think you had the very first case in the country because I remember you were really advocating for testing of that patient. Um, and, yes. you know, I, I was so, you know, proud of you and so happy that because, you know, people testing has been such a, a challenge in our country, right? From the beginning, you know, as infectious disease yeah. physicians, we've been sort of in tune to this since December. Um, and when we had, you know, sort of our gut feeling with certain patients meeting criteria, unfortunately, we weren't able to test, you know, many people in the beginning because there were so many restrictions, you know, it was only based on travel, it was only based on age, you know, so I can only imagine the challenges you faced with that patient. Yeah. And so, you know, he tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 twice. And I actually then I pushed for a CT scan to look for the infl infiltrates and CT didn't want to take him because he was a risk. And I said, no, this is going to change my management. I need you to take him. So, yeah, I mean, we had to advocate for our patients. Uh, we've had to advocate for testing. I've had to advocate uh, with the Illinois Department of Public Health in the beginning when when uh, it was oh, only if they've traveled or only if they've 
you know, met certain criteria. And so there have been multiple patients that I've called the public health department and said, no, I need this patient tested. So, you know, we've had our challenges, like you said. And so, um, so as we recognize the syndrome more and more, I think it's, uh, it's vital that um, we're able to recognize it, that, that parents are taking their children in to the pediatrician's office. I think that's been a big deal with COVID. You know, people are scared to go to the doctor's office. They're scared to go to the hospital. So we've get, been getting sicker patients because people are waiting to, a little bit too long. So it's really important for uh, parents to call their pediatrician and just keep in touch with their, um, their family physician to know when's the time to go to the ER, when's the time to do a face-to-face -face visit as opposed to a virtual visit. So um, just um, keep that in mind when you're um, taking care of your children. I think that's an amazing point that you just brought up because we know for a fact from the American Academy of Pediatrics that pediatric immunization levels have dropped significantly. I think in ages yeah. zero to two, they've been okay. But after that, there's been a sharp decline in immunizations. And the most common question that I've been getting that I'm sure you've been getting as well has been about schools reopening in the fall. And I find it so ironic because, you know, we're not even practicing, you know, the basic thing about immunizations and vaccinations for our children to even, you know, think about, you know, let alone the COVID case count and things like that. So that's a very important um, uh, point that you made that I think people really need to be aware of that physicians, you know, doctor's offices, hospitals, everybody has precautions in place to see healthy patients, you know, you're not going to be, uh, you know, put next to a patient necessarily that may have COVID, you know, everybody's taking the right precautions, having PPE and making sure that we protect, you know, all of the patients, no matter what age group they're in. Um, and I think we don't want you to wait till, you know, it's really bad to then present to the hospital or really where your child is very sick or very ill, waiting to that point where they may require much more severe, you know, intervention. So you definitely want to at least call your your pediatrician at least you know run something by them if there's something that you know is alarming you or you're just not sure with this multi-system inflammatory syndrome uh, children usually have ongoing fevers for five days or so they have a lethargy abdominal pain you know they're just not acting like themselves so you know you should you know these things should really set off some red flags and we really do want people to just you know confer with their physicians about all of this just to put something in a little bit of perspective also, although we have, uh, you know, these uh, conditions presenting as a sequela, you know, of uh, COVID-19 exposure, such as MISC, um, in New York State, you know, just to give people kind of the idea of the rarity um, in the pediatric population, we had over close to 400,000 cases of COVID-19 and roughly about 200 pediatric patients with uh, MISC. So just to show you that it is still a very rare finding. Again, those numbers, you know, as long as uh, you agree with me, Dr. Akras, those numbers will likely change, unfortunately, with, you know, the up, uh, you know, uptick in cases that we have throughout the South and the Southwest. Um, you know, and we know that four to six weeks after exposure, that is when we start seeing these rare inflammatory syndrome in the pediatric population. So, you know, as we're in this evolution of this pandemic, you know, those numbers are likely to change. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's important to highlight that it's not just the South and Southwest, like I yeah. uh, took a road trip with my family this weekend and driving through Indiana and Ohio, it was just like a totally different universe than being in Chicago. And I have a, a, a physician a colleague of mine who drove her daughter to Boston for med school to resettle her. And she said the same thing, like between Illinois, and then when you get to Boston, everybody's masked up and, you know, I'm taking it seriously. But in the in between, it's like a whole other universe where people think that nothing's going on, there's no masks, and they look at you like you're nuts if you're wearing a mask. So, um, you know, it's just important to highlight that, you know, in, in, in different pockets of the country, people are not taking this as seriously as they should. Absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, I say this frequently that being from the epicenter in New York, which was hit the hardest, you know, we wouldn't wish this upon anybody. Um, and, you know, initially, as a country, all of us felt that, you know, people were very lax because it was happening in China, and then it was happening in Italy, it was happening elsewhere, it wasn't happening here. And for our country, we sort of have a similar kind of scenario, it was happening in New York, it's not happening here, it's not happening in Florida, it's not happening in California. So people were very lax, and we still see those kind of attitudes. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, as you're aware, the virus does not discriminate and, you know, everybody of every age is being affected. So another question that someone had for you was, um, what are your feelings about beaches and do you feel that they're safe? 
Yeah. So um, as long as you're able to socially distance, I think actually beaches are a good place to be because the winds um, kind of, you know, you're outdoors and then, and then lake effect or, you know, ocean effect winds kick in. And so that helps ventilate the area and keep the virus from uh, settling. Um, and so as long as you're able to socially distance, that's actually a place I've taken my children frequently this summer, even though the water's not been open, but the sand has. So uh, we've gone to just uh, make sand castles and things like that. And just uh, any 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 activity that gets them out of the house, outdoor, smelling the fresh air and active, I've been trying to incorporate into our lives. So I think beaches are safe as long as not like the pictures we're seeing from Florida where everyone is up on against each other, but like a socially distant beach where you're, you know, having at least six feet between you and the next family. Uh, I think it's a good activity. Yeah, I think that's a great point to highlight. As you said, people are having different types of behaviors based on the part of the country that they're in. So really what we do know for certain is that the virus is transmitted very easily in certain types of scenarios. So crowding, you know, um, is definitely that scenario. So you definitely, you know, want to keep that in mind is that you want to try to, again, maintain, you know, get um, benefit of being outdoors and, you know, the fresh air and, and activity, which is good for your mental and physical health, but make sure that you're maintaining within your household or the people that you've been around, um, you know, for the most part. And what is your feeling about public pools? Yeah, so um, the same thing, public pools. Um, so uh, we don't expect that the virus lives in the chlorinated pools. So that's not the issue, but the, it's the culture around public pools where people are gathering and they're crowding and they're, you know, standing at the stands to buy some food or whatever. So that's really the issue. It's not the chlorinated pool. So if you have your own chlorinated pool, I don't think it's an issue to go swimming even after a, another family has gone swimming. But if you're not able to keep your children away from other children or other human beings in a six feet fashion, then that's where the problem comes in and that's where the risk comes in. So I don't think that the, the virus necessarily survives on, in chlorinated areas. I actually don't think it survives in chlorinated pools, but it's the, the areas around the pool and not being able to keep our children away from other children in the pools. Absolutely. I agree with that completely. And I think the main issue with um, public pools is really, again, that you tend to be in a very crowded um, scenario. And then it's the sharing of, you know, the surfaces that are frequently used, that there's lots of contact, lots of activity, whether it be railings or, you know, lots of people touching the same kind of areas. And then the public bathrooms, of course, is the biggest concern with crowding areas that are very small, not well ventilated. We know that most public bathrooms don't have large windows, don't allow for a lot of ventilation. And people a lot of times will linger around in these bathrooms. And unfortunately, that's a scenario where virus can, uh, you know, spread very easily. So the next question we have is, um, what's your feeling on sports? Um, so sports, I think if they are non-contact sports like tennis or um, baseball is less of a, a contact sport um, and you're with the same kids um, and it's the same cohort of kids and not that this kid is playing on your team and then he's playing on 10 different teams. So really just knowing, um, so, I, I, that, you know, it, it's different scenarios for different activities. Like obviously if you're going to go into a public sport with, um, with the, the park district, you don't necessarily know all the kids, you don't necessarily know what's going on in their families. So in that case, I would say tennis <laughs> is an okay <laughs> sport. Um, less so football or, you know, wrestling. Um, but if you have like a group of kids that you know, um, and then then doing like drill drills, basketball drills, where they're not really sharing the basketball, but just shooting hoops or, you know, things like that. Um, or baseball, which is not a very contact sport. And the kids, you know, are not, are being socially distancing from other, you know, from like, they're not out in crowds and things like that, sheltering a place, things like that. So obviously non non-contact sports, are iffy as long as long as you know that the kids that you're playing with are not uh everywhere out and out and about yeah i think that's a really good point uh that you brought up there is that people especially in many states that are you know have reopened and are reopening and people are trying to get back to some sense of normalcy um, you know, it's uh, not, you know, unusual for people to feel like, you know, they've been sort of, uh, they're kind of having this cabin fever, you know, they've been and the kids, especially everybody's yeah. been inside, and they want them to be able to have play dates and get back to their sports and things like that. But I think it's important to realize that, you know, even though these are your friends, you know, your friends, your children's friends, you don't really know what uh, amount of, you know, um, 
care other people have been taking. You know, who has this family? You're, you know, now interacting with another family, another whole household, another child, and you don't know what, you know, that's um, essentially inviting back into your household, you know? So those are the things to really keep in mind. And kind of along the same lines, people are asking about play dates. You know, I assume it would be a very similar answer. Yeah, same thing. So if you know a family is sheltering in place and they're not going out and about and they've been sheltering in place for the last couple of months, um, I think it, it's okay to start, you know, having play dates for your kids outside. Um, we've done that with my, my, for my kids and some of their friends. Um, we have some rules that everyone has to go to their bathroom in their own bathroom before they come. They hand sanitize before, when they come. They play outdoors. Um, nobody comes into anybody's home, um, you know, unless there's an emergency, obviously. Um, and just keeping things outdoors. The boys play some basketball drills. The girls are riding their bikes or their scooters. So just keeping it, um, you know, as mitigated as possible. That's really great advice. And I think another thing that parents, I think, really need to think about is having um, some sort of control over the situation, right? So you want to sort of pick, um, you know, wherever you decide to do whatever, uh, you know, amount of activity you feel comfortable with your children engaging in, think about the kind of situation you're going to put yourself and your child in, you know, how much control do you have over that? You know, can you control the amount of crowds that might suddenly appear at a beach on a hot sunny day, you know? Um, So, you know, those are the things, you know, you may want to have some control over where, you know, you decide to have this kind of interaction and that might make things a little bit easier, you know, from mitigation perspective. Um, So another question that people have is, uh, you know, what is your feeling about camps? So camps are a little trickier, especially overnight camps. Um, I actually did a talk for the Easter Seals uh, group about camps. And I think after my talk, no one wanted to do a camp. Um, So, um, uh, you know, especially if they're sleeping in the same uh, area, it's just, um, it's harder to like not share uh, bathrooms in a camp. It's harder to not share equipment in a camp. So I'm a little leery of camps at this time, and I actually wouldn't send my children to a camp. Um, yeah, I know there are some camps that are opening up. And again, we're, we're just talking about how we can mitigate and we're not going to eliminate the risk altogether. So, um, you know, I have told people that if your only alternative to childcare is a camp and you have to work, then, you know, hopefully the camps are taking the necessary precautions where the adults are wearing the face masks, you know, keeping things out outdoors as much as possible, keeping groups cohorted as much as possible, um, not allowing other visitors to come in from other places to the camp, and then taking out a symptomatic person as soon as they become symptomatic. So all of those strategies help to mitigate. So um, the more mitigation strategies and prevention strategies that your camp is taking, the better. Uh, But I personally uh, would not send my child to a camp this summer. I think that's really great um, advice. And I think what um, I want people to take away from that is that, you know, even if you decide to send your child to camp and, you know, again, it's a personal decision that you have to do, whether it be day camp, daycare, whatever situation that you're in, um, I think people need to know that they have the right to ask the facility for their plans. You know, what are their plans? You know, there are strict guidelines from the CDC, from the state health departments, and we want to make sure, you know, it's an honor system and you're assuming that every place is really adhering to these, you know, rules and regulations, but you can't just assume that. So I think as a parent, I think it's really reasonable for you to really ask the facility to see their plans, you know, what kind of procedures do they have in place? Are they doing screening of their employees? Are they doing screening, you know, of the children? Um, Are they making sure that, you know, excessive people, as you said, are not coming in, you know, parents for what's their drop off and pick up, you know, scenario, all these things, but it's very simple. And people sometimes feel like they don't have the authority to ask to see these plans or to hear. And I I think that's something that parents really have to be proactive and, you know, uh, think about their child's best interest and, and health. Um, so the last question that I have here is somebody asked, what are the risks for MISC in South Asians? Um, so we know that Kawasaki's disease, there is a predominance uh, for South Asians or, or not South Asians, but like people from Japan and China and, and, and that area. Um, so I haven't really seen so they have talked about, like in England, that uh, the population that they've seen that with MISC, there has been a, a higher risk in the Afro-Caribbean or South Asian uh, population. Um, but I haven't seen that transmitted over here in the United States. So um, 
I think it's hard to say. I think that the, the data isn't completely out there. Um, we know people of color have had an increased risk of acquiring COVID uh, and, and getting sick with COVID as adults. Um, probably the children too are getting the are getting the you know the, the the virus whether they're symptomatic or not, just based on maybe living conditions and uh, inability to shelter in place due to like need to work and things like that. Um, but I haven't seen that there's been a higher specifically South Asian um, population with MISC. Great. Thank you so much for answering that. And thank you so much for your time and for answering all these wonderful questions. Um, and I hope, you know, you continue to stay healthy and safe. And, you know, thanks for everything that you're doing for all of us, uh, you know, on the front lines. You too. Thanks, Uzma. Thanks so much. And I hope you stay healthy and safe as well. Thank you so much. I'll speak to you soon. Take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Salam. Salam.